interesting to look at the different faces and some are smiling bigger and some are a little frowning and some are somewhere in between, but I'm going to try to be happy today. And I'm hoping that that will sort of carry over to you and uh, reflect out that way. We'll, we'll see guys. We have some really good things we want to talk about here today. And, uh, I'm looking forward to it very much. I'm really looking forward to the baptism. Uh, we're going to pray that the weather holds. It's the forecast is about 10% chance of rain this morning. So we're hoping that uh, it doesn't rain in this area. And oh, I need a different cable here. We've got you covered here. Thank you so much. Is that looking unto you, sir? Oh, I saw the light, man. I saw the light. Okay. Okay. So we'd like to just say again how thankful we are. You know, we were supposed to get in here at eight o'clock, and we got in pretty close to eight o'clock, and. Brother Anthony had a, a really sweet message for us, and I hope it's a, really a message of encouragement, especially for young people, and I hope you'll take heed to what he said. And uh, he finished a few minutes early, so we're actually just a minute or so early, and I think I'll be finishing a little early, and we may need that time for the baptis baptism. Um, but I'm looking forward to the baptism. I'm looking forward to the communion service very much. Um, I'm supposed to share a little bit with you at that time, and hopefully my wife, Sherry, is going to sing a song for you at that time. I think it'll be a really touching song and very fitting. And, well, you know, it won't be long after that. We'll be getting ready for Sabbath, and the sacred hours of the Sabbath will be coming in. And then we'll just have one more day, and this camp meeting will be over. And that seems hard to believe, doesn't it? How many of you have really been blessed at this camp meeting? Is there anyone who's disappointed here? I tell you, I've found so much more here than I ever expected. And I've just, I think that everything that's happened has been a highlight to me. You know, I, I know that some of the things that Brother Jordan was preaching might have seemed a little hard for some to hear, uh, but it was really great. I, I really appreciate his his dynamic push, you know, and, and, and the way that he was sharing. And I appreciated Brother Sammy's talks. They've been just really pointed about things that we need to know. Uh, Brother Anthony has really shared from his heart some beautiful things for us, and uh, everybody has participated. The singing, my, the singing has just been superb, and I just love to hear you sing as a congregation, and I wish I understood Swahili because the, the language is beautiful. It flows well, and the singing is really sweet. I appreciate that, so it's been a blessing. I'd like to invite you where possible to kneel as we ask a blessing and bow your heads if you don't kneel well right now. Our Father in heaven, this morning we thank you so much for the blessings that you've given to us so far and we certainly need more blessing. We look forward to more. And I ask, Father, that you will work in a special way through your servant today, that you will guide and direct his thoughts, his lips, his words, to be just what you want these people to receive today and give them ears to hear. We ask, Father, that as we continue the rest of this day, that you will give us good weather for the baptism. We have to walk over to the place, and it's not too far, but it's just not next door either, so... We, we want it to be nice, and we want as many as possible to attend. So please help us to do all things decently and in order. And I thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. The week before I came here in the United States, the wife of our 39th president, Jimmy Carter, died. Her name was Rosalind. Rosalind Carter died. And her husband was our 39th president. And he had been in the United States Navy when he was younger. He had went to our United States Navy Academy at Annapolis, Maryland. 
And he graduated, graduated, I think, 32nd out of over 800 men. So that sounds pretty good. Well, one day when he was a young ensign, his, the, the chief of the Navy at that time, Admiral Rickover, was interviewing him. And he said, how did you do at Annapolis? And he said, I graduated 32nd out of my class of over 800, you know, sort of thing that's pretty good, you know. And Rickover asked him just one question. He said, did you do your best? Did you do your best? And Carter, who was somewhat known to be an honest man, bowed his head and said, well, no, I didn't do my best. And Rickover simply asked him, why not? Why not the best? You know, beloved, we should be the best Christians on earth, shouldn't we? We should be the Christians known for being the loving Christians. We should be the Christians known for being the benevolent Christians. We should be the Christians known for being obedient Christians. We should be the Christians known, oh, please, please, Alan, don't say that one. We should be the Christians known for being on time. Amen? Yes, we should be, shouldn't we? Why not the best? And you know, when we think of this subject of the three angels' messages, it is a message when you combine it with the first, second, and the fourth angels' messages, it is a message that is designed to bring perfection to the people of God. In Hebrews chapter 5, if you would read these verses with me, please, in verses 8 through 10, speaking of Jesus even, though he were a son, yet he learned what? Yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation to all that obey him, called of God and high priest after the order of Melchizedek. But it says, and being made perfect. I thought Jesus was already perfect. Was there something imperfect about Jesus? Well, we need to understand the Testament, this word perfect, it carries a lot of connotations or nuances. And one of them is the concept of maturing, maturing. You know, the Bible says in Luke 2.52 that Jesus increased in wisdom and, and, and stature and favor with God and man, right? So he was maturing even as a human being. His character was being perfected. Not that there was anything wrong with it before, but that it was growing. It was maturing. And God wants us, friends. Are we work, um, I'm fully plugged in here. I am fully plugged in. second let me get back in here a little better try it again what i have here almost all just bible verses so we can follow along in our own bible if it doesn't get up there but in hebrews chapter 6 and verse 1 the apostle tells us therefore leaving the principles of the doctrine of christ let us go on into what perfection not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith. To the law perfect? The law is perfect. But friends, the law is impersonal. The law can't touch your heart. The law has no power to save you. It only has the power to condemn you. The law made nothing perfect, but the bringing in of a better hope did, by the which we draw nigh unto God. In Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 9, he says these things were a figure for the time then present. They were what we call a type. They were a symbol. It says, in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him that did the surface perfect as pertaining to what? The conscience. Have you ever heard the expression, I've got a bad conscience or he has a bad conscience? You know, we think of the conscience as sort of like the, the moral compass that God has instilled within each one of us. 
there's a certain degree, even through nature we learn, the Bible says, of what is right and what is wrong. We have this inherent moral compass. And until we continue to rebel and rebel and desist the pleading of the Holy Spirit, that moral comp compass is there. And of course, aided with the word of God to show us, to tell us what is right and wrong. But we inherently, friends, even apart from the Bible, know that certain things are wrong. But these things of the Levitical priesthood, they could not bring perfection. Now, leaving Hebrews for just a second and going to 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 57, Paul here is primarily speaking of the resurrection. But I want you to look at the text and just think of the text for a minute. He says, but thanks be unto God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Friends, if we are going to be raised in that first resurrection, those who have died, they're going to be raised because they have overcome sin. And the victory that we have in having victory over the grave is really the victory in overcoming sin. And that's what we need today, friends. We want victory over sin. And sin fundamentally, yes, we know the definition of sin. There is one definition of sin. It is the transgression of the law, 1 John 3, 4. But what God is expecting, what he needs from us, friends, is to, to, to get to the root of the sin, why we have this sin, and that fundamental root is selfishness. Brother Jordan shared a quotation. I don't believe it was from the original source. It was from one of the devotional books, but it was actually from volume four of the testimonies where it was talking about under the heading of selfishness came every other sin. And I would encourage you to go to volume four of the testimonies and read that. I think it was entitled an impressive dream, but Ellen White spoke about she she saw the judgment open in heaven and under and then the books were open. And she says the one book was the, the sins of the professed people of God. And she says under the general heading of selfishness came every other sin. The friends, the law can't fix that. The law can show us our sin. The law can condemn us quite readily, but the law can't lift us up. And the law cannot save you. But Jesus Christ can. Jesus Christ can. In 1 John chapter 5 and verse 4, we read, For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world, and this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. And where is that faith to be, friends? It's to be in Jesus Christ. Because he is the one who has overcome. And through his priestly ministry, we have good things to come. Going back to the book of Hebrews in chapter 9, verse 11. Hebrews 9, 11. But Christ, being come an high priest of good things to come, by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained, or the Greek actually more accurately says, thus securing eternal redemption for us. He has secured eternal redemption for us, friends, as he has taken his own blood and entered into the sanctuary in heaven. And Paul goes on to say, for if the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of an heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctify to the purifying of the flesh, there were rituals they had to go through when the flesh became ritually unclean and he says those things could purify the flesh ritually through the rituals the flesh itself they could become clean but that's not what we need to cleanse we need our consciences cleansed we need sin taken out of our hearts friends and he says how much more then shall the blood of christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to god purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Amen. God wants to purge our conscience. And the only way your conscience can be pure, friend, purged is, is this, if sin has been removed. Going into chapter 10 in Hebrews. Verse 1. For the law, having a shadow of good things to come, and not the very image of the things, can never, with those sacrifices which they offered year by year, continually make the comers thereunto perfect. Again, he's contrasting the old Levitical priesthood system 
with the priesthood of, of Christ. And he says the law, it was a shadow of good things to come. It told us about Christ and his coming. But and, and when it speaks about law here, it's speaking about the Torah. Not speaking about the Ten Commandments, but the Torah. Those All those laws, the Torah, they were to show us good things to come because they were shadows of good things to come. Now, you know what a shadow is? And I, I guess I have a small shadow up here. The lighting is so nice and even, but there's a shadow back here. It's, a, it's like an outline. It's an image of me, but it's not me, is it? The shadow actually has no substance of itself. There's no no power in the shadow to do anything. I suppose sometimes if we were in a in a dark room, we saw a shadow coming around the bend, and it was night. And you know, if it was in a movie, they'd be playing this eerie music, and the shadow might scare you, but it can't help you, can't hurt you. Verse two. For then would they not have ceased to be offered, because that the worshiper, worshipers once purged should have had no more conscious of sin. If these things had worked, they would have been purged. They wouldn't need to continue this. He said they kept doing this year after year. You know, throughout the year, you would have the sin offering, right? And you came to the 10th day, the seventh month, and we had what was called the day of atonement. And that was to be a cleansing of the sanctuary when it was all to be cleansed. But you know what they did at the evening, as the evening came on? They started the ritual of the evening sacrifice again. It all got started all over again. Every year, cleanse the sanctuary, sin again. Every year, cleanse, cleanse. It just went on and on like that, friends. But this time, in reality, it will not continue a second time. He says in verses 3, 4, but in those sacrifices, there is a remembrance again made of sins every year. Why? Because it is not, or for, because it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins. Just cannot happen, friends. Continuing, he says, wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he saith, sacrifice and offerings thou wouldest not, but a body hast thou prepared me. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, thou hast no pleasure. Verse 7 and 8. Then said I, lo, I come in the volume of the book it is written to me to do thy will, O God. Above when he said, sacrifice and offering and burnt offerings and offerings for sin, thou wouldest not, neither hadst pleasure therein which are offered by the law. Then said he, lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first that he may establish what? The second. He eliminated that Levitical system, that priesthood system, so that he could establish the priesthood after the order of Melchizedek and take a people who could not be perfected in the Levitical law and bring them to perfection. You know, there's, there's some very sincere brothers and sisters in our movement who believe that today we must still keep these feasts under the Levitical system. But according to Hebrews chapter 10 and verse, it says that he taketh away the first, that he may establish the second. And when we try to hold on to the first friend, we prohibit him from having that second working in our lives. Continuing in verse 10, by the which will we are, what? Sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Christ died once. He didn't die repeatedly over and over and over. So I ask you a question. Do you really think God wants you to be sanctified, brothers and sisters? Does God really want you to be sanctified? How do you know that? Because he says so in his word, doesn't he? If for no other reason, we have 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 3. For this is the will of God, even your sanctification. Friends, in the Word of God, in the Bible, we have power, don't we? Hebrews 4, verse 12 says, For the Word of God is powerful. It is the word powerful. That means it's full of what? Full of power. Full of power. I was asking Brother Stephen earlier, I said about how many 
kilograms, how many kilos of, of uh, corn or maize did you have to make the ugali for the camp meeting? And he told me about 300 kilos worth. That's a lot, isn't it? About 300 kilos of, of maize. And if I had that 300 kilos up here on the platform in one place, and I asked you to come up and pick it up, do you think you'd be able to do it? Well, what if I told you I thought you could do it? Would that help you? If I told you I really thought you could, you know, Brother Dan, if I told you that I had 300 kilos up here and I think you can pick it up, would it make a difference in you being able to pick it up? Probably not. I don't think so. But you see, friends, when I tell you to do something, if I tell you to reach up and, and, and touch the ceiling, how many of you can do it? Is there anyone? We've got a couple of guys that might jump up and touch it. I don't know, but I couldn't do it. When I was younger, I could have, but not today. Too old for that now. Such a shame. Friends, when God tells you something, when God tells you something, can you do it? Yes. Why? Because, friends, all of his biddings are enablings. He says, Jesus says, be ye therefore, what? Perfect, even as your Father, which is in heaven, is perfect. Now, I ask you a question. How perfect is that? How perfect is our Father in heaven? Well, that's pretty perfect, isn't it? You don't get much more perfect than that. Now, it's interesting that the context of this statement is under loving our enemies. God loved us. The Bible says why we were yet enemies, Christ died for us. And if we can learn to love our enemies like God loved us, then I think we're going to be pretty perfect friends. In Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 8, it says, Wherefore he said, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Why? For the perfecting of the saints. For the perfecting of the saints. God wants us to be a perfect people. He wants us to be a complete people, a mature people. He says he's given us this Till we all come into the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a what kind of person? Perfect man unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. God is going to look at his people, friends. He's going to look at his people and he's going to measure them. He goes, says, you know what? They measure up to the stature of my son, Jesus Christ. And the reason they can do that, friends, is because they have Christ living in them, the hope of glory, amen. They've become a partaker of the divine nature, having escaped the corruptions in the world through lust, and they are living like Christ. In Hebrews 13, and verse 20 and 21, Now the God of peace, that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you perfect how much? in every good work to do his will. So my, my brethren that are husbands and fathers, you guys, you men, God wants you to be a perfect husband, a perfect father. I'm sure we all need wisdom to be the best fathers possible, but he's promised us that if we ask wisdom, he will give it to us, amen? We need perfection, friends. We need Oh, we need that love to treat our wives as they deserve. The Bible says, husbands, love your wives. How? Even as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. This morning when Sherry and I were praying in our room, I asked God to help me to be the best husband I could to her. And I know, Sherry, I fall far short. And I want you to know that tomorrow I want to be a better husband than I am today to you. I love you. And I hope each one of you men will say something like that. And you sisters, you sisters, pray that God will help you to love your husbands, to honor and respect them. And hopefully they will be worthy of that honor and respect. I remember a sermon that was preached about 46 years ago. I don't think very many of you will remember any sermons that were preached 46 years ago. But this sermon stu stood out, and I've never forgot something the minister said. He was talking about family life. We've had some sessions on family life here. And he said this. He says, Christ 
Christ is worthy of the love of the church, but most men are not worthy of the love of the wife. And sadly, that's true. But friends, let's change that. What do you say? Let's change that, men. Let's make a difference here. Now, we know, according to Romans chapter 3 and verse 20, that by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in God's sight, right? We can't be justified by the law. Again, the law is, is powerful. It's powerful to crush us, but it has no power to save us. In the Review and Herald of February 8, 1898, Ellen White made a couple statements I want to share with you. Were the law understood apart from Christ, it would have a crushing power upon sinful men, blotting the sinner out of existence. But by understanding the law in connection with Christ, receiving him by faith as his substitute and surety, man sees himself as a prisoner, but a prisoner of hope. She goes on. The truth as it is in Jesus is an acquaintance with the holy, just, and good law of God, and this law is elevated and its immutability demonstrated in Christ. He magnified the law, expanded its every precept, and in his, in his obedience left man an example that he also may meet its demands. So the law condemns us. The law can crush us. But friends, through Christ, we can meet the demands of the law. Going back to Hebrews 10 in verse 11. And every priest standeth daily, ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. Again, Paul is contrasting the Levitical system with the priesthood of Christ. And then he says, but this man, referring to Christ, after he had once offered, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, set down on the right hand of God from henceforth, expecting till his enemies be made his footstool for by one offering he hath perfected for them forever them that are sanctified do you know what the the mass is the catholic church has something they call the mass and in the mass there's this process called transubstantiation i don't know if you've heard that word or not but transubstantiation and in this the the priest is supposed to, through his prayer, change that common bread and common wine into the literal body and the literal blood of Christ. And through the Mass, he is offered again and again. The Bible says that he was offered once for us. In verses 15 and 16, whereof the Holy Ghost also is a witness to us and at, for after that he hath said before, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws in their hearts and in their minds while I write them. Now, if you go back, if you go back to Jeremiah 31, it says the Lord says this, but here Paul says the Holy Ghost says this. Isn't that interesting? And then in verse 17 and 18, in their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. Now, where, no, where remission of these is, there is no more offering for sin. In other words, he's saying that when God fixes our sins, finally, friends, there will need to be no more offering, no more sacrifice, no more mediation, because he has accomplished by Christ, through Christ, a new and living way, which is consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh. That veil in the most holy place, separating the holy from the most holy place, which hung by hooks or nails, represented the flesh of Christ. He who would hang by his flesh upon the cross of Calvary for us. And he was 2.4 to 14. For as much then the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death. That is the devil. Jesus Christ came to this earth he took upon himself humanity. He took upon himself our flesh and blood so that he might destroy the devil. Well, I've got several more texts, but I don't want to go through them all. I think that we have had enough, mostly of what I want to say. But I want to, to come down to Hebrews 12 now and verse 22 here for just a minute. He says, But ye are coming to Mount Sion and unto the city of the living God, 
the heavenly Jerusalem and to innumerable company of angels. Some of you folks have only met just at this camp meeting maybe. And some of you have come from Uganda or Ethiopia or various places. And some of you from within Kenya don't get to see each other very often. But here at the camp meeting, we can come and we can join together and we rejoice. It's a wonderful time. Friends, there's coming a time when all of God's people and all of God's angels are going to get together. And he says to the general assembly and church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made what? Made perfect. And to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaketh better things than that of Abel. Is there any doubt? Is there any doubt based upon the word of God? We've just been reading these texts mostly that God has a plan to perfect you through the ministry of Christ in the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary. This is the message of Paul throughout Hebrews. It's the message of the rest of the Bible. He says, he gives us a warning now in Hebrews 12, 25. See that you refuse not him that speaketh. For if they escape not who refused him that spake on earth, much more shall not we escape if we turn away from him that speaketh from heaven. Paul says also, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? And of course, the implied answer is, friends, that we will not escape if we neglect this salvation. In the book Maranatha, on page 241, Maranatha is one of the devotional books of Ellen Weiss. She says, let us strive with all the power that God has given us to be among the hundred and 44,000. Do you want to be a part of the 144,000? I do. I do. They're going to have privilege, friends, that others will never have. And it's not because they are better, but God is going to use them and he is going to perfect them and a generation, a whole nation of people, as we read Earlier in this week, in Isaiah chapter 26 and verse 2, there's going to be a righteous nation which keepeth the truth that's going to enter into that city. And they will have been perfected through the Christ in a way that no other generation was perfected. We're told, we're told that in the state of New York in the United States, that there's a grave of William Miller. And we are told that angels are watching over that grave, waiting for the resurrection of the just. Isn't that something? But you know what? William Miller was a Trinitarian. And William Miller was a Sunday keeper even. But he had a heart that wanted to do right. And even though he didn't understand everything, God's going to be able to save him. But friends, in the end time, there's not going to be any Trinitarians. There's not going to be any Sunday keepers. There's not going to be any violent husbands. There's not going to be any nagging women. That's right that are going to be a part of the 144,000. God's going to have a group of people, and they've got all of their act together. In volume two of the testimonies, on page, I'm sorry, volume eight of the testimonies, on page 241, she says, this is no time for the people of God to be weaklings. We cannot afford to be off our guard for one moment. Friends, it's not a time to be weaklings. It's a time to be strong people, strong in the Lord, amen? Now, I want to I want to just buffer all of that I've said today just a little bit. Just a little bit. I don't want you to get discouraged. You think, you know, Brother Allen, I know I'm not there yet. Am I lost? No. I want you to notice what Paul says in Philippians chapter 3, verses 13 through 15. He says, Brethren, and I'm speaking, this is me. This is my experience. And I pray it's your experience today too. Brethren. I count not myself to have apprehended. I don't say I'm perfect today. I'm not saying I've reached that standard today. I'm not telling you I'm there today. Don't look to me for the example. You look to Jesus, friend. Jesus is the author and finisher of your faith, and that's who you look to. He says, brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind, and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I 
press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Let us therefore, as many as be perfect, be thus minded, and if in anything ye be otherwise minded, God shall reveal even this unto you. God is going to show you. He's going to demonstrate you, as we learned yesterday, step by step, the things that are needed for your character development, so that when Jesus comes, you will be ready for his appearing. I want to be ready for his appearing, don't you? You know, there's going to be a group of people, according to Revelation chapter 6, and they're going to be people from all walks of life, rich men, poor men, captains, bondmen, freemen. And it says that when Jesus comes, they're going to pray for the rocks and the mountains to fall on them and hide them from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. We're either going to be in that group or we're going to be in the other group that Isaiah says. We're going to be able to say and look up and say, Lo, this is our God. We have waited for him and he will save us. That's the group I want to be in. That's the group I'm striving to be a part of. And that's the group that God has promised to put me in. If I will surrender myself to him, he will come into my life and do that perfect work in me through his son. Amen. If that's what you want to, would you kneel with me in prayer, please? Or bow your heads. Our Father in heaven, oh, we thank you so much for your blessings. We thank you for Jesus Christ, who died that we might have eternal life. And we thank you, Father, that through the merits of his high priestly ministry in heaven today, in the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary, that we can be brought to perfection of character. We realize, Father, that our flesh and its infirmities, we will have these things until Jesus comes. But in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, those things will be removed. But Father, today, through the transformation of our characters, through the renewing of our mind, help us to be like Jesus in character. May we be truly a partaker of that divine nature. And I thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen.